good afternoon. This is uh, Mike Stenhouse with our first real kind of formal version of In the Dugout with Mike Stenhouse. Kind of reminisce of my playing days back in pro baseball when, you know, either before a game or after a game, we'd just be sitting around with other guys. In our case, we'll be sitting around with guys and gals and, and we just um, talk about life, talk about politics, talk about what whatever was on our mind, the game uh, today, uh, social lives, whatever. So we're, we want to have a very casual series. Um, uh, discussion, a uh, series of video discussions with our friends. Sometimes it's going to be teammates on our team. Some, sometimes it come people from other teams. And uh, let's, so let's bring in our first guest here on In the Dugout, and that's going to be our teammate, Justin Katz. So let's bring in Justin. Justin, as many of you know, is the research uh, director uh, for the center, and he's also the editor of the popular online blog, Ocean State Current. And as I pre-warned Justin, we're going to invite, since this is a baseball theme or in the dugout, we're going to invite all of our guests. They don't have to. We're going to invite all of our guests to wear the hat of one of their favorite teams. I've got my Pawtucket Red Sox hat on. I played for them in 1986. Justin, uh, you got to put on a cap today? Uh, sure. I don't actually have a baseball team hat, but I have a classic vintage anchorrising.com <laughs> baseball cap. So. Whatever works. So uh, we, we hope this will be a great, uh, great tradition. And uh, so Justin, you're in the dugout with me. What, I don't know. What's, what's on your mind today? What do you think? Well, I'm tracking the, you know, after days, maybe even weeks of the governor, people asking the governor, you know, could we see the model that you're using to predict how bad this is all going to get and therefore affect all of our lives? Can we just maybe take a look at it? She finally released a chart yesterday and it's really, uh, it, it's almost one of those things you're, you're, I was anticipating it. The center actually put out a statement saying, Congrat thank you, we commend the governor for putting out more data, but then you see it and it, there's so many problems with it. That's, I, so I've been spending a lot of time today trying to think of what they could be thinking and, and why we can't just do things, you know, we support science. Why can't we do it in a scientific way, which means telling people your assumptions, giving the data. Yeah, no, and I was, I've been looking at charts too from national models and there's a big difference between the modeling, isn't there? There is, and that's why the way this is supposed to work, and you know we've done modeling on school choice or budgets or whatever, taxes, and uh, what you're supposed to do is you explain your assumptions, you say here's what my assumptions are, here's what I predict, and on an ongoing thing like this, I mean the governor's chart doesn't even accurately reflect what's happened in the past week. So how right, are you going to tell me what's going to happen? Let's take a look at the governor's chart. We'll get our great producer, Larry Gilhini, to throw up the chart. Larry, throw up the, the governor's chart. The famous uh, red and blue lines, right? So the, um, so the, the blue lines uh, are, are what they predict, and, and the red lines are the work, kind of a worst-case scenario. Now, now, Justin, now you were commenting on Twitter today. So right now we've got, what, about 250 people in the hospital, 250 beds? Yeah, 252 today. Was the and we went up seven, right, today? From yesterday, yeah. So presumably that means, I mean, I mean, it probably means maybe 10 or 12 new patients and maybe four or five people who were discharged, right, kind of thing. So we don't know what that, do we know how many of those seven were new and how many were discharged? They're not giving us that data, are they right now? No, I mean, there were something like 13 more deaths, so that would factor into it. Um, yeah, so when they're in the hospital, right. Yeah, one of, one of the problems is we're, they're not telling us the active cases data. So we don't, they don't, they're not telling us when they're assuming people are done being sick. So our, we've got a cases that keeps going up because they right. never tell us who got better. And so it's hard to gauge, you know. I think or who died, but, right, all who died, right. sadly. But you're right, you're right. They don't give us that. So that's active cases. They don't tell us how many people have recovered. Uh, on how many are active, and so you really get three categories. Come to think about it, right? You got you got active cases, recovered, and deaths, right? I guess that would be the yeah, three pretty much. Right? It would be nice to see that breakdown. Um, all right, so let's go back to the bed. So so you know you know the governor's blue line. You know, both of these, um, you know, they're also projecting. Uh, it's not on this chart, but they're also projecting about two thousand deaths through the end of the summer or into the fall in Rhode Island and those numbers, both the, this blue line here, and both of those are what the governor would call optimistic, I guess, for Rhode Island, right? Better than the red line. But they're both twice as much as, as the national IHME model. So, to, so, so if everybody looks at 
these charts, see the 2250. Why don't you, uh, Larry, bring up the um, the uh, all, Rhode Island all. You'll see that, the, and we'll show you on the second chart, that the deaths projected in the hospital are half as much as what the governor is projecting. What do you think is going on here, Justin? Well, one of the things they're doing that they do well on this, these charts is they show you the bottom, like the best case scenario. You can almost see a little bit in the corner there in the pink, that's um, hospitalizations. Actually, they're showing that it's, it's feasible that they'll start to go down now, which is actually closer to what I predict. I think we're going to peak about sometime in the middle of next week. But the that's the first thing they're showing. But the, the problem we have is that the governor's model, we have no idea what her assumptions are, where it's coming from. Um, I haven't done it, but I, I think on the IMHE, maybe I have that backwards, you can actually probably go on there and dig in and they'll give you some of the math. But that's how you know science is supposed to work. Uh, we have no idea what it's causing the governor to project this. And well, I, as, oh, go ahead. Yeah, beyond that, I mean, here's the thing that doesn't make sense to me, Justin. Uh, and, and again, in a dugout conversation, we can cut each other off, right? That's what, <laughs> that's what you do at a bar, so you do a dugout. So I'm, I, I do it rude. in regular interviews. So don't there you go. That. Good. Do it. Good. So, so, so I, again, I want to get this flow out there for everybody. It's just two people chatting away here. Um, but, but we got 250 something beds being used now they're projecting even at a best case scenario 2250 which is eight or nine times as many people in the hospital as we have now and, and we just went up seven in one day i mean it just doesn't make sense that we can go from 250 to 2250 in the next Week. 16 days yeah well yeah, we, you I would mean, need to see hundreds of new cases every day and just to to be clear the governor isn't showing us her best case she's showing us her best estimate which is usually somewhere between the best and the worst uh so yeah it, it's just not realistic and so you can even see on this chart that's up there now there every day they adjust it for the actual number so that you yeah, it does chart is right yeah the the, the, the governor's chart right now shows around a thousand in the hospital at this moment. So I, you have to wonder what good is a projection that that's four times greater right now than what it says, uh, than what it should be. All right, so let's, let's do a little math here. We'll do a little math. We've got what, about how many, how many quote cases do we have? 4,000 something right now in the state? I think yeah, something like there, that. Right. All right, so, and we know that 250 are hospitalized, which which is about right. We know that between five and 10% of, of the total amount of cases normally get hospitalized, right? We know that. So let, let's be generous and say it's 10%, even though right now we're showing less. So to get 2,250 beds, you'd have to have 22,500 cases at 10%. At 5%, you'd have to have 45,000 cases in our state. And right now we're at 4,000. I mean, and a lot of people think we we're probably close to peak. So again, is it, is it, I, I, I'd love to know there's a, some, how the heck can, can we project that there's going to be that many beds, that many cases, and therefore that many deaths, right? It just, it, it, well, it just doesn't make sense. And what's really bothersome about it is the way the governor's office has been controlling information. So you've got reporters kind of, from what I understand, they all, there's a certain, open, a certain window where they can ask questions and you have to, it's almost like when you used to call into the radio to try to win the, the baseball tickets or whatever, you know, you had to, you had to be right by the phone and you had to be caller number five. That's kind of what it seems like. They all sit by their computers and send an email real with their, their questions. Questions and maybe they get at, they get to ask one, and they if they had more time to you know sit in a giant state house room and. But well, didn't she press. implement some kind of after TV follow up session with reporters? I don't know, it, but anyway, there's something like that. But it's but the the point is it's it's not really a conducive environment for asking right. questions like this. Right. Like, well, how can you possibly say we're going to have that? And so what they end up doing is essentially transcribing what she said that day, and it, it's so All we're right. not really getting good information. Larry, bring up the um, the death chart. Let's just spend a minute on that. So the governor's, uh, we, we, while we don't have the governor's red and blue line on deaths, um, we, we know that her, she's projecting 2,000 total deaths. Um, as you can see uh, in the middle of the screen here, this national model, again, projecting less than half of that many with a peak number of deaths per day to be at, a, looks like at about, 30 per day, you know, on May 2nd, May 3rd, somewhere in early May. We had 13 new deaths today. And as you can see in the bottom chart here, 
they're projecting the total tests will pretty much level off after June 1st. She's talking all the way through October that tests will increase to 2,000. So again, you know, I, I don't know. It's, it's the same. It's the same discussion. I just wanted our viewers to see this. All right, thanks, Larry. And Adam. So, so here's. So let me give one other thing relative to death I saw today. I, I can't think of the guy's name. You know, there was a former New York Times reporter, Justin. Remember his name, who's kind of made news, but he's calling out a lot of the national reporting on this, saying you're really not giving you the you know. Anyway, he's made a big splash nationally. He put out a tweet today. Apparently, you know, so this big antibody testing, right? We're all talking about. That's important. That's going to tell us how many people have had it, right? So we can be more accurate with our counts and our death rates, but also it tells us who might be immune to catching it too. So they've started rolling out antibody tests. Apparently, Stanford University is doing this. So they tested people in nearby Santa Clara, and they they are estimating that three percent of the population in the, in Santa Clara had had COVID-19, had the China virus, um, which is 50 times more than the number of reported cases. Okay, that make you with me so far? So that means if you take the death rate, which is about 3% now, because that's the number of deaths over reported cases, but if the reported cases is 50 times more, that means the death rate is 0 0.0015. Uh, or or, or 0 0.1, 0 0.15, no, 0.15%. So that means that this thing could be a heck of a lot more contagious than we thought, but way less dangerous than we thought. What, what do you think about that? Well, I think that's, that's entirely feasible. I mean, when we all started reacting to this, we had data we didn't really trust from China, and then it spread to Italy and Iran, which are not the best run countries in the world. And so all of our models were skewed by this, this early experience with, with countries that seem to do things, not be doing things well. So we really didn't have good data. Uh, and so it's, it's entirely possible. Of course, a lot of the, a lot of the moves we made were, re were reasonable given the fact that we didn't know what this thing was gonna do, or what it would be like. But I, I, I do think there's a very plausible future where we look back on this and say, yeah, that was kind of a, at best, a good dress rehearsal for the next one that will really be dangerous. But All right, I see the managers told us to get in the field in a few minutes. That means we got to cover a few more quick, quick topics here. I got to go out and take some batting practice here. But um, I, so, so we've seen it, you know, as, as, as most of our viewers know, we're part of our national network of free market think tanks. And, and I often in regular contact with my peers and I'm I'm seeing what's going on in their states. And there's a theory out there that some of some governors, and I'm not gonna say our governor, but I'm gonna say some governors are purposely overhyping the amount of cases, the potential amount of deaths, the potential amount of ICU and hospital beds. So they can keep, they can have an excuse to extend their emergency powers. They're like little dictators right now. They can pretty much do whatever they want or at least they're claiming they can do whatever they want. There's a number of lawsuits actually being filed in many states against governors who civil libertarians are feeling of overstepping their bounds. So are we just in another fear-mongering state? I don't, again, I don't want to talk about this governor or anyone specific, but do we think there's some fear-mongering going on here so government can, can justify why it takes some of the severe actions we've seen in our state and in others throughout the country? What are your thoughts? Well, I think there's there a lot of incentive for governors to overreact to begin with, because if you're the governor who doesn't do that and you have all kinds of deaths, you, that's a problem for you. And then it becomes a problem if you did overreact, because now you've got to cover for it with a general public who's going to say, what was that all about? So there is a lot of incentive, uh, w even without any kind of political uh, conspiracy theory, that there were incentives for them to react that way and now to try to hide it a bit. Uh, and I think what's gonna be important for, for all of us after this whole thing is, has passed by or at least calmed down is to ask, well, what now? I mean, up until now, these declarations of emergency, even a month or two ago, everybody would kind of say, okay, we've declared an emergency. That's just to get federal money. <laughs> you know, that, that doesn't really mean yeah, anything. Right. Yeah. But instead what we're seeing is- Is it about this, a power play or is it about- it, Well, it seems like- it, a leftist agenda, what is it? Well, it, emergency powers aren't supposed to be for, you know, this rolling crisis. They're supposed to be right now. There's a fallout area. There's a hurricane. 
we need to be able to shut things down. That, I think we really need to evaluate that. And I, th I think there's a bit of a power play here. I mean, I th you get the sense even our general I mean, people, assembly. I mean, it's hard for me to imagine. Do people really get drunk on power? I mean, does that really happen? Look, no, I, can, I, I can control everybody in the state like a puppet with a pull of a string here. I mean, it's hard for me to imagine people really do that. I mean, I, I, I don't know. Yeah, maybe, I, don't know. I, I think they convince themselves that it's nice for the best. I, well, I think they've convinced themselves it's for the best. You know, I, I have all the data. I'm making the good decisions. If, if I give up this power now, then I won't be able to do that. All right. We got to get our spikes on here in a minute or two, so. But, but um, uh, you wrote on the Ocean State Current. So, so the reason we bring up this drunk on power, that means a lot of governors are crossing lines. It doesn't mean the Constitution goes away, all right, <laughs> when you have executive power. And in a lot of states... Uh, some could argue the state, but in a lot of states, governors and towns and mayors are crossing that line. There's a number of lawsuits. You've written about a few instances regarding a golf course, a church. What else? T tell us about those and what else. Where where are you fearful that our civil liberties in this state are being infringed upon? Well, the thing that really makes me fearful is that there was so little reaction to some of these stories. I mean, so there were two, three golfers from Massachusetts who golf courses were shut down in Massachusetts. So they came to Rhode Island. Mass Rhode Island tried to say, you know, no, nobody from out of state can come here without quarantining for 14 days. So they parked their car at a uh, McDonald's and snuck off to a golf course to play a few rounds. And the idea is of that that's dangerous. I mean, you're walking around in open field, swinging a ball, Yet they sure were arrested. Get plenty of room to social distance out there, isn't there? Yeah, exactly. And so, so that I mean, maybe that's a one-off thing, and you kind of, but that's something that ought to generate a reaction. And the same thing with the palm branches. Uh, the governor issued a quote directive saying that churches yeah, not could an not order, get out. not an order. Yeah, but it, but it, so it was a directive, and it, but it sounded like an order. In fact, in one church, I think police were called to go investigate that palms were being handed out. But it's just clearly unconstitutional because you can go to the store and buy flowers. Police were called because the church was exercising its religious freedom. Right. And think about that. Yeah. Think and about that. and the, none of the, what really, really bothers me is none of the stories that I saw were the journalists saying, okay, governor, how do you have the power to do that? How can that not be constitutional? Instead, it's like they were calling the bishop who wasn't even in control of this particular church and the Catholic bishop and saying, well, why, why is somebody giving out palms? Why is that person not following the governor's orders? And that's what's really disturbing to me is to see the news media just sort of, yeah, you, they're supposed to be guardians of our freedom. That's why we we want a free guardians press. of guardians of veritas is what they're supposed to be. Of truth. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. But and then I got in a back and forth with Dan McGowan of the Boston Globe about this. The yes, as a journalist, you're supposed to report what is happening. But part of what is happening is that our civil liberties are being encroached upon. And so that has to be part of the story. If you don't mention it, everybody just figures, okay, this is normal. And that's where it's really dangerous because this can get can bad real quick. All right, managers call us, Just Time to go take a little batting practice. So uh, thank you, uh, off your cap to the fans out there. Our millions, with the headset on. millions of fans, I'm sure, watching us and in the dugout. But we're <laughs> about to go take the field. Justin, thanks for being our first uh, chat member. And uh, Oh, thanks, thank, thank you all. See you on the next episode of In the Dugout. Have a great week.